Do you want us to stop the um, video while others are presenting to save bandwidth? Um, it's not the worst idea. Uh, we also w ask that you mute your microphone. If you've got background yeah. noise, I'll, I'll do that. Um, all right, so we're getting some uh, attendees in. While folks are, are coming in, I'll, I'll remind everyone of our uh, ground rules here at CrimCon, and I will welcome everyone to CrimCon. This is our third day. This is stream two, and this panel is titled Methodological Challenges and Breakthroughs. We have four really interesting papers. We're very excited to, uh, to see these papers here today. I, I want to uh, remind everyone uh, what our rules are. So we have 10 minutes for each one of our, of our presenters um, to present their work. I'll be keeping time, and we will be keeping them uh, to time. I'll let you know when you've got uh, about a minute left. Uh, questions can be asked of our presenters at any point during uh, the presentations. Hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. We'll get to as many questions as we can. We'll be taking those throughout the presentation, but we'll be answering them all at the end. Um, so with that, again, we're here with methodological challenges and breakthroughs. Um, we will go ahead and get started with uh, scholarly attitudes towards innovative research methods in the intersection of criminology and computational sciences. Thank you very much, Troy, and uh, a huge thank uh, for the conference organizers uh, for accepting our presentation and our research. Um, this is an honor to be here. Uh, so who we are? My name is Caroline Party. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the Department of Sociology, uh, Virginia Tech, and uh, my co-author uh, in this um, presentation is uh, Akos Sigeti, doctoral student uh, from the National University of Public Service, Hungary. And uh, we are going to talk about our research on what does innovation mean in sociology. So we started off from the idea that we need to refresh sociology in order to keep pace with the increasing digital presence of people as research subjects. We live, communicate, work, study, do business, play, get married, break up, uh, spread ideas in a digital world, and sociology must shift to the digital in order to better understand digital society. So we need innovation. Um, and as a jumpstart concept uh, of the research, uh, we thought for, to myself, to ourselves, that it is clear that data scientists and computer scientists need social sciences help in building a more rigorous sampling design methods and data analysis that are also ethical. Social science, in contrast, needs data science's novel approach in analyzing um, digital trans, uh, transactional data and derive valuable and relevant research results. Well, we wanted to know what social and data scientists think about these questions themselves. Do they see this cooperation necessary? If yes, in what aspects? What are their concerns? And most of all, what means innovation to them? We sent out an online survey to various social media platforms such as LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, in our survey, we examined the willingness of social researchers and data scientists to use various research methods and tools. Um, and we concluded the survey with uh, 84 usable respondents. As a follow-up, we had expert interviews with the respondents who were willing to talk to us by providing their contact details uh, at the end of the survey. And we interviewed 22, 22 researchers in total. Everyone was eligible uh, for participation uh, in the interviews uh, who were doing uh, an uh, academic research uh, with a social science connection. So um, it's not, uh, not only social scientists and data scientists, but everyone was invited uh, who did research with a social science connection. 
It's worth to mention that uh, most of our respondents operate uh, uh, in the areas of criminology, crime sciences, and sociology, because uh, this is uh, how we are, where uh, this is the, uh, the, the area that we are active in. So here uh, are the large categories and subcategories emerging from the interviews methodology challenges, the definition of innovation, dissemination techniques, and uh, open science. Uh, the definition of innovation refers rather to inter and multidisciplinary cooperation than the application of shiny new digital tools such as chatbots, web tracking applications, mobile applications, you name it. But one important condition of interdisciplinarity is uh, to get a basic understanding of each other's approaches. For this, uh, we should create room for interoperability, which is the usability of each other's tools. Uh, and this is, according to our participants, is the precondition for the transmission of methodologies and tools between the sciences. The non-competitive approach of both qual and quant methodologies and community participation also came up as innovation, which may be the key to better understand any social phenomenon. Participants listed the current methodology challenges of social sciences that hinders innovation. Uh, the research ethics problems stem from the conflicts of digital research and the ethical requirements of social sciences. Among these, they mentioned the lack of consent from research subjects, the dilemma of connecting databases, the question of whether the databases can be shared or published among researchers. They claimed that the root cause of methodological problems are the lack of education. Remember, uh, primarily we, we are talking about uh, 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 criminologists and uh, uh, researchers who are active in crime sciences. Higher education needs to place a greater emphasis on the methodologic methodologies uh, of scientific research, planning, data gathering, and data analysis in the digital world. Besides this, cooperation between science spheres must be facilitated by colleges and universities and uh, research, institution, uh, research institutes. Uh, the main issue that hinders interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary cooperation is the conflict of approaches between, the, uh, between data science and uh, social science. The data science approach is a mathematical logical one and uh, social sciences approach is a context-based one. And uh, that makes um, social scientists uh, have a hard time learning programming and data science uh, can have a hard time understanding the complexity of social concepts. Uh, thus, to establish successful cooperation, there is a need for translators or interpreters who mediate between the representatives of different disciplines and help resolving conceptual discrepancies. Other obstacle is the academic gatekeepers, um, publication places and faculties. Professional journals and conferences must seize the inclusion of uh, the, the exclusion, sorry, uh, must seize the exclusion of uh, related sciences and scientific fields and must accept articles from cooperative research groups combining the different aspects of different science fields. And a big chunk of the challenges uh, has to do with engaging stakeholders. Uh, these are practitioners who should rely on science and research in an ideal world. When communicating with stakeholders, the researcher must omit uh, substantial details. Uh, um, and the same applies with researchers uh, uh, who apply for grants. You have to be plain, you have to be convincing, but logical. These require skills that the basic university education doesn't cover. Uh, so developing the communication and monetization skills should be a mandatory part of any college or, uni or and university education. Worth to mention here 
that most participants typically use the classical methods of dissemination, which is what I'm doing now, uh, presenting in conferences and publishing in ac academic journals. Uh, this is no surprise here because uh, that is what is rewarded in academia. But more than half of the respondents never used online mass media to distribute their results and never used uh, visualization techniques, uh, interactive solutions in order to help uh, transmitting results to a larger audience. Uh, the issue of open science going to be, is going to be related to the academic gatekeeping. So open science provides uh, an avenue for reproducibility, scientific transparency, data sharing, data accessibility, and the rigorous explanation of research methods. Uh, these are also the criteria of uh, trustworthiness and also uh, facilitate the cooperation of researchers as well as the cooperation between practice and research. So in summary, our research results point to the adaptation of innovative solutions and the openness of researchers enabling the creation of interdisciplinary cooperation. Uh, they present the transmission of uh, data, uh, methodology and findings as the keys to innovation and practical usage, the solutions to data quality and research ethics challenges. Uh, the foundation of this can be built by using uh, interactive dissemination techniques uh, aligning by uh, the digital society's requirements and also the transparency of the research uh, process, aka the practice of open sciences. And um, we didn't include here the limitations, but bear in mind that uh, we had uh, um, uh, quantitative data of a small uh, sample uh, which is far from representing uh, um, uh, the, the scientific community, uh, which is doing research uh, with uh, sociology connections. And uh, most of our respondents operate in the areas of criminology, crime sciences, and uh, sociology. And with that, thank you, and feel free to ask us questions or comment. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm resisting the urge to comment because it, that it impacts my work so um, so much. We we will move on to uh, to match or not to match a comparison of control group techniques for interrupted time se series analyses. And while we're getting started there, I'll remind everybody that you can ask questions of our panelists. Hit the Q and A button down at the bottom and type in your question. We'll answer as many of them as we can at the end of the session. And it looks like you're muted. We can see your slides, but we can't hear you. Okay, you I got the camera undone, forgot the microphone. Happens uh, to the rest of us. So, uh, well, I'll start over, it's just my name. Um, so my name is Michaela Mize. I'm a PhD candidate at Washington State University. I study criminal justice and criminology. And one of my research interests within this is the use and development of quantitative methods in social sciences. So I conducted a study of different control group techniques um, using interrupted time series analyses, um, which is a common approach, especially in criminology lately, to approach um, evaluating public level intervention. So policy changes, program, inter uh, program introductions, things like that. So first, I will start with a brief overview of what an interrupted time series is. So using a segmented regression approach, we're able to determine the trend of an outcome prior to a specified intervention um, or interruption immediately following this intervention or interruption, and then over time compared to the pre-intervention trends. Um, so simply speaking, the pre-intervention trend is assumed to have continued if there were no intervention, and that's what that post-intervention trend is compared to. The problem with using a single interrupted time series, which is what this um, graph depicts here, is how do we know that the intervention is in fact what caused that change? And how do we know that there's not something else going on that would be seen in other places that had nothing to do with the intervention? So in most studies, right, we add a control group. 
So I'll bring this up again as I go through my specific results. Um, but in order to compare these, we look at the difference in intercepts, which is important, but the most important is this difference in pre-intervention trends. You have to have statistically similar pre-intervention trends in order to compare post-intervention trends. So in a multiple interrupted time series, um, you can see the difference in immediate changes and then over time. And again, we cannot make conclusions about this over time unless we have similar pre-intervention trends. And the importance here with that is that when I was going through to develop these control groups, most of the problems arise here in this pre-intervention trend difference. So what I decided to do was evaluate the arrest rates for marijuana possession in Washington state for adults over the age of 21 between 2010 and 2016. Now, the reason I chose Washington state and marijuana possession arrests is because in December of 2012, Washington state legalized recreational marijuana for adults over the age of 21. So to be expected, there should be a huge decrease in arrests at this time, which would allow for a great demonstration of interrupted time series. I only included agencies that reported for 100% of the months between 2010 and 2016, which gave me about 51% of the population and included four out of five of the, of the most populated cities. And not surprisingly, there was a huge decrease at the time of legalization for marijuana possession arrests for adults. But how do we know that this is due to legalization? It seems intuitive, right? Because that's when the law passed. Um, but how do we know? So we had a control group. I tested three different types of control groups um, to determine if one was superior to another, because I've seen these in several different studies. So I first looked at an average of all of the possible control states. I looked at individual control states. So I matched Washington with every individual state that I could. And then I created a synthetic match using those possible control states. So these, the states highlighted in blue are the ones that I used as a control using the same UCR data from 2010 to 2016. I included only states that had at least 40% of the population of that state represented within agencies that had reported for 100% of the time. Now this is a limitation because obviously in Washington there's 49% of the state that wasn't covered and now in these um, states, I'm also excluding quite a lot that don't have 100% reporting, future studies should look at imputation methods to increase this. But I also excluded any state that had a changing policy for marijuana between 2010 and 2016. So anyone who medicalized, decriminalized, or recreationalized marijuana was excluded. And this resulted in 21 possible control states. So overall, I ran about 30 models for time purposes. I'll give you three. Um, so I started with an average of all the possible controls. And I took three averages. I took one with all possible controls, one with only medical, only states with medical marijuana, and then states with no marijuana laws, or, or the where marijuana is illegal entirely. And again, um, I want to make clear the thing with a multiple uh, interrupted time series model is that the conclusions about post-intervention trends can only be made if pre-intervention trends are similar. So here's what my average control looks like. I had several covariates included from this from census data. I and mean, because they are at the year level, I didn't have enough data points to run interrupted time series on those to find similarities over time. But I did run a t-test between whatever my control group was and Washington. Clearly, the average control is not similar to Washington on any of these covariates. Um, and all of these covariates were significant or were significantly correlated with marijuana arrests, which is why I included them. Um, but like I said, this is not similar um, in terms of characteristics. The starting arrest rates for Washington were much smaller than the average across the rest of these controls. However, the pre-legalization trends were similar. So again, this is what we're really looking at is these pre-legalization trends. At the time of legalization, Washington still has that significant decrease, um, and which we saw in the single group, but it is not represented in the average control. So there were no significant increases or decreases there. And then over time, it's non-significant, meaning this drop originally um, in marijuana arrest could be sustained um, in Washington. Let me make sure I caught everything there. Yeah. So again, this was an average of all possible control states in or compared to Washington. So now the next one that I did was individual controls. And again, I compared Washington with every state 
every possible control state. Using um, those covariates, so I ran t-tests on all the covariates, looked for anything that was similar characteristically to Washington. Um, no state had anything more than one similarity on these covariates. However, there were several states that had pre-intervention trends that were the same, um, and only one state had both pre-intervention and intercept similarities. So Utah was very similar to Washington in terms of arrest rates prior to legalization. However, characteristically still very different. At the time of legalization, there is still that big decrease for Washington, which was again seen in the other control model and the single interrupted time series. And the overtime is non-significant. Now, if you look at this model, it's very similar to the average control. The difference here is while Utah may be closer pre-legalization and with these intercepts and trends, there isn't necessarily as much contextual value for the comparison because how does Utah relate to Washington? They're entirely different states, they have different demographics, they have different political views. So how, how useful is this comparison? So then I looked to a synthetic control, which takes all of the possible controls um, and then combines them using the selected covariates to create a weighted average, which is used to pr provide a synthetic Washington. So trying to make something that is as close to Washington prior to legalization as possible. In this model, all but one of the covariates was used. When two races was included, the pre-legalization trends were entirely different. Um, so, and this was the least significant or least correlated of the variable. So I removed that and found that the, at least in this model, one of the covariates was similar to Washington. In this model, we still have a different in intercept rates, um, but the pre-legalization trend again is similar. So in all three of the control models I've shown you today, they have those similar pre-legalization trends so you can make those post-intervention trend um, comparisons. The decrease is still significant for Washington and over time non-significant. If you look at this negative six, it is very, oh, sorry, I guess you can see over here, the negative six, it's very, very similar to the other three models that I've shown you. In essence, there aren't that many differences here. The one thing again, is that this, even though it's a synthetically created match, it still does not necessarily characteristically match Washington all that well. So which one do you use? They're very similar. Um, Part of it has to do with data availability. Do you have the ability to choose more than one control option and do you have covariates to control? Ultimately, you have to have something with similar pre-intervention trends. Without this, you can't make those post-intervention trend comparisons. If possible, you wanna match on similar characteristics because again, that contextual, it's not necessarily useful to compare, compare states at least that aren't similar. And finally, most of these analyses were looking at something that has treatment versus no treatment. However, I question that because if we're looking at state level, it's so different, maybe we should be looking at groups within state level. They may be more similar and it might be the group difference, not the intervention that could um, give us some real answers. But regardless of what you choose, you should be transparent in the method and justify why you chose one over the other in any presentation or paper. And there you have it. Thank you so much. Um, you you were done exactly on time, which caught me uh, off guard, not looking at our um, at our, at our program. Um, reminder for the for the audience: you can ask questions by clicking the Q and A button down at the bottom. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, next up, we have challenges and solutions for collecting auto ethnographic video diary data. Okay. <laughs> All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Danielle Bailey. I'm an assistant professor of criminal justice at the University of Texas at Tyler. Uh, my co-author on this project is Dr. Jennifer Klein, an associate professor of criminal justice at UT Tyler as well. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting a research methodology that we used, uh, or should I say attempted to use, on a research project back in 2018. Um, I want to talk to you first about how we plan to collect the data and then discuss some of the challenges that, that we experienced. 
So to get us started, I want to talk about what an autoethnography actually is. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, an autoethnography is a qualitative research method in which the author describes their own experiences and their own reflections. Um, it's often presented in first person. Autoethnographic data can take a variety of forms. In social sciences, we most often see this in some form of writing, like a journal, a diary, letter, etc. cetera, um, but it can also be performative in nature. So the goal of our project was to collect autoethnographic data through video diaries. Our plan was to provide each participant with their own private YouTube account. Um, participants could then use the record option within YouTube or they could upload an MP4 file to this account. Either method would serve as a single video diary entry. Both the researchers and the participants would be able to access the account. So once participants uploaded the videos, we could then download them on our side. We asked that participants record approximately six videos a month for two months, but we did tell them that we were collecting data June to December. So they were welcome to upload more videos if they wanted or spread out their videos over a longer period of time. So what was the goal of the video diaries for us? Um, Dr. Klein and I both examined the unintended consequences of sex offender policies on those who are listed on the sex offender registry as well as family members of those listed. This research project was an outcome of us wanting to collect data on this impact in a way that hasn't been done before. Generally, researchers examining the unintended consequences of these policies will use survey instruments or face-to-face -face interviews. These methods can be very useful for gathering data, but it's always in a retrospective manner. The video diary concept that we wanted to use had one big advantage, which was that the timing of the video diary entry was completely controlled by the participant. So these could occur immediately following an event rather than a set time period after. This would allow us then to identify whether the unintended consequences that they experienced were relatively rare but significant events or whether they were felt in a more everyday manner. We limited the original project to family members of those who were listed on the sex offender registry only, um, but we did get approval for the inclusion of any family member 14 years or older to participate. So um, this project, this research project did not come together as hoped. Um, I want to use the rest of the time to talk to you about some of the issues that we ran into with this project. And then I'm gonna end with some brief suggestions for future studies that use similar methodologies. For brevity's sake, I'm not going to go into depth with all of the challenges, um, but I'd be happy to answer questions about them in Q&A. Our first big challenge was the video diary concept itself. Um, video diaries, by their very nature, include identifying characteristics. So we had to go through a full board IRB, and we had to do extensive consultation with our IRB about online safety concerns and privacy protection. Um, I want to show you some of the materials that we had to create uh, before we got the study approved. Um, first, we created a Qualtrics survey for participants to sign up where they would give written permission to participate. Our IRB also wanted to have subjects provide verbal consent during their first video. So we had to create a consent script that we then asked all participants to read verbatim the first time they recorded. Um, and because of our use of minors in the project, we had a separate consent and assent documents for minor participants and their parents. We also created a probing question hand that had some sample questions that helped participants think about what they wanted to talk about in the diary entry. And we had to create instruction sheets showing our participants how to upload the videos to YouTube. Um, we actually ended up creating a website that provided step-by-step -step instructions for our participants because the setup and the sign up was so confusing. It had so many steps and the written and the oral consent and the YouTube creation. Um, and of course the website itself needed IRB review and approval. So there were a lot of things to get in a row before we could even get the study started and, and approved. The other issue that we ran into was the YouTube account setup process. Um, we needed to create unique channels because we would have access to them. So we thought it would be easiest to create a new Gmail account for each participant and then create an associated YouTube with that email. Um, we ran into an account verification issue with YouTube that we hadn't thought about. Um, and it would choose if we had had more participants, which kind of luckily, but not luckily, we didn't have. Uh, which leads me to the second issue, which was our extremely low participation rate. 
Um, we had gotten approval for 50 people from the IRB and we only got eight people to complete the written consent form through Qualtrics, even after multiple rounds of recruiting. Um, something I wanna highlight here is that the low participation rate is not a result of lack of interest in the study. In fact, uh, we have very good relationships with a lot of community advocacy groups. Um, we had a lot of people that expressed serious interest in this project before it started. So we expected good participation. Um, but my co-author, I think, put it best. She said there was a disconnect between the abstract interest in the project and the desire to actually participate. Uh, we both feel like the complicated nature of the study setup process was at least a small deterrent, if not a larger one. Um, it might have also been the video requirement. Uh, we're not really sure. Whatever it was, there was a large disconnect that seriously impacted our recruitment efforts. Another issue that arose was a very high attrition rate. Uh, from those eight people who actually consented to the survey via written consent, we only received videos from four participants, and of those four, only two subjects had more than six videos total. So in the end, we actually couldn't publish off this data because we simply didn't have enough data to actually answer our research questions. Um, we sent follow-up emails, we sent offers of assistance multiple times throughout the study, but they did very little to increase the data yield. Um, we don't know, maybe participants too busy, or maybe they felt their daily lives weren't interesting enough to report. I don't know, but we, we just didn't have that data that we were hoping. So uh, my co-author and I have talked a lot about this project since uh, we did this, and we've talked about ways to improve, and I wanted to share some of our thoughts here. Um, we actually are hoping to redo this project at a later time. So if anyone in the audience has additional suggestions, we'd love to hear them during the Q&A. Uh, we can reach out us directly with our contact I'll give you at the end. Our first suggestion is to use a different video hosting platform. We thought that using YouTube would be beneficial for participants because they could record right there on the platform itself. Um, but most of our participants who admittedly are usually, uh, were usually older, simply weren't comfortable with the platform. Um, we think that maybe providing participants with a USB drive or an external hard drive, or even like a handheld camera, um, and then picking them up at the end of the, the study would have limited the technology challenges that many of our participants faced. Our second suggestion is to provide methods of video and non-video diary entries. A simple voice recorder would be super easy for those participants who are not tech savvy. Um, but I don't suggest excluding the video method entirely because I do think you can gain so much data from that method that you would lose by focusing only on non-video options. Another thing that I think would have helped our recruiting was to do separate studies for adults and minors. Um, including both of these populations made the whole consent process very confusing. Because we already had multiple consent processes anyway, um, I think having like split off of adults here, juveniles here, uh, scared away some potential participants. So we both think that a separate websites, separate studies entirely for the adults and the juvenile participants would have reduced confusion and possibly increased participation for us. All of that being said, uh, one of the things that I would suggest not changing is using the, the website as a recruitment vehicle. It was really nice to be able to email people interested in the study and give them an entire website to browse at their convenience. And the website also served as a good repository for all of our handouts and our forms. So it was, a, it was a, just a really good place to have everything together. Um, so I would definitely recommend using that kind of website idea, at least for the recruiting of a similar project, um, if not for the study itself. All right, well, that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, or if you'd like to talk to more about our projects, um, you can always feel free to contact me or my co-author at the emails and phone numbers provided here. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's incredibly important to see um, <laughs> to see work like yours. We don't we don't have enough in the literature about research. Um, I don't want to say failure, but uh, but that, that's what it is, right? <laughs> it, um, it is. It feels weird. It feels very weird to be presenting on, on like this didn't go anywhere. But yeah, <laughs> but it's super useful. Um, Next up, we have where are we using Scopus to map the literature at the intersection between artificial intelligence and crime? Yep. Okay, let me. Yep. 
just a quick reminder for everybody that when you've got questions, hit that Q&A button down at the bottom and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Just a second for it set up. Should it be black, but no, okay, yeah. All right, thanks everybody for organizing these and thanks for uh, thanks to the attendees for being here today. So I'll be presenting this work, uh, which is entitled, Where Are We Using Scopus to Map the Literature at the Intersection Between Artificial Intelligence and Crime? It's based on a paper that was recently published in the Journal of Computational Social Science and it's open access. So I invite you if you're interested to pick that up. So a little bit of background. Um, recently, artificial intelligence approaches as only gaining a success, success of site in traditional areas of computer science, statistics, and engineering. Uh, many other social sciences by economics, political science are experiencing uh, the diffusion of computational methods, including artificial intelligence ones in the realms. And the study of crime has also been influenced by this process. Um, there's an increasing number of studies that apply algorithmic approaches to explain, predict, or forecast criminal behavior and criminal dynamics. And these studies are actually also from computer scientists and statisticians that are uh, trying to develop models and techniques to study crime. Um, criminology as, as it was said before, is a little bit lagging behind. And my interest was motivated by the fact that there's no study currently on the mapping of the situation at the intersection between these two areas. So the use of AI and the study of crime. And I tried to um, fill this gap by uh, using a quantitative approach uh, and scanning the literature section uh, between AI and crime. So the work is mainly motivated by three research questions. First one is what are the current research trends in terms of topics in this area? Uh, the second one is what, what is the current structure of scientific collaboration investigating criminal issues uh, by means of AI approaches? And the last one is what are the most active countries in the scientific sector? I think that all the questions are able both to picture the situation, the current situation, but are also able to facilitating us in understanding the future of these uh, field or area of, of research. And I, I think it, it is a crucial question uh, to be investigated because of the increasing um, uh, deployment of artificial intelligence and algorithmic techniques to uh, solve real world problems also from a policy making point of view. So the analytical strategy, uh, I use data gathered from Corpus, which is a gigantic library uh, of scientific production. And I gathered uh, almost 700 scientific records uh, by means of this research query, which is basically structured in two dimensions. The first one referring to crime um, topics and the second one to the most important areas in, in artificial intelligence, which are artificial intelligence itself, but also machine learning and deep learning. And by means of methods that are uh, derived from network science, uh, which is a successful frame of study of scientific collaboration. Um, studies in the literature that actually apply network science techniques to understand how um, science is produced, how science is communicated, but also how scientists engage together. So overview of scientific trends is a plot that actually maps the percentage variation in the production of studies, both in AI overall, so overall studies that actually use AI, regardless of the uh, real, regardless of the type of application, and studies that actually use AI to study crime. And uh, what uh, really emerges from this graph here is that, um, well, of course, we cannot really compare the true numbers, the raw numbers, uh, because AI overall uh, um, produces a, a, a larger number of, of topic, of papers and articles and items. In general, what we see is that uh, AI and crime in the last years, in the last 15 years, actually had uh, Big jumps. Uh, there are it's proportionally bigger compared to the AI overall uh, literature. This means that actually there's an increase, and this means that actually every year, besides some some observations, we see um, uh, an increasing trend in the number of publications uh, in AI, which is higher proportionately compared to the AI overall. Which means again that there's an growing interest in uh, the application of AI techniques to the study of crime. Uh, well, for what concerns the trending topic, I use keyword analysis from again, a, a network science point of view. And what emerged, I use both uh, author keywords and uh, index keywords. So, author keywords are keywords that are provided by the authors when they register the publications. The uh, 
index keywords are actually uh, coded by and uh, by experts from Scopus. And I both try to, and I try to use both to be sure that the results were stable across both methods of indexing. And the um, consistent result here is that um, the most important keywords are generally related to cyber and crime. Uh, while there's a warring red flag and warring red, red flags tells us that there is a, a extremely marginal uh, presence of ethics related keywords. So keywords, for example, to transparency, accountability, ethics of algorithmic um, and, and treatment of, of people of different races and different um, backgrounds, different economic uh, and social strata, uh, which I think, again, is a worrying red flag, given the uh, recent scandals in, in many applications of algorithmic decision making, criminal justice and policing. And uh, we should do better uh, on that, of course. I think in the last years there's an increase in interest in, on this topic, but still, if we look at keywords here, I, I think the first uh, ethics related keywords were ranked 80th or 90th. So um, there's definitely something to improve here. And again, the keywords are generally related to uh, digital crimes or computer and cyber crimes. And then what concerns the authoritative networks that we can um, visualize here. Uh, the graph actually tells us that there's a highly disconnected nature of collaboration. Uh, the wide majority of authors are in the larger component that are in the larger component are actually affiliated to institutions based in the US, China, and Australia. Previous literature on uh, authorship networks tells us uh, is that disconnectedness and geographically homogeneity generally lead to a fragmented area of research. And this generally means that there is a high difficulty in uh, sharing ideas, circulation of, um, of ideas, and in, in the ability to be inclusive in the research agenda. Uh, so all these are authorship networks. And as you see, again, there are a lot of components. And there are a lot of components that are completely disconnected. And there are a lot of isolates uh, in, in the uh, bottom right of the graph. Um, and what generally this, uh, if we compare this network to other networks in other fields, uh, the main point is that here we are missing a gigantic, a giant component in the middle that actually works as uh, accounts for and of, of the entire network. Well, in this case, uh, we're very far away from that. And if we look at a collaboration at the country level, uh, what we identify here is that, first of all, we have a lot of isolates, uh, generally countries in Eastern Europe and Northern Africa. Uh, and the generally United States, China and India are the most central countries. But uh, if we look at statistics um, from this analysis, we detect, I detected that um, on average is a low level of, of international collaboration. And on average, uh, the countries that are peripheral tend to collaborate more with foreign labs and research groups, while um, labs and research groups that are based in the most central um, countries like the United States, China and India are less prone to collaborate internationally. And this, of course, is a great limit in, in, in scientific in inclusivity and in the ability to build um, a solid, uh, uh, a solid, strong um, research community. So issues of this analysis work you now. Um, again, the increasing deployment of AI uh, in the real world calls for increasing attention uh, and focus on the ethical aspects of AI and crime. Um, topics like fairness, transparency, and accountability. And I want to make um, clear that our colleagues in computer science and statistics and mathematics are doing better than us in handling these problems. And I think it's a shortcoming as criminologists. And um, efforts have to be made to counter the disconnectedness in the collaboration networks, maybe creating agendas that are transdisciplinary creating venues and a situation in which people from different communities can actually collaborate, communicate and sharing ideas in order to create, again, a solid community, um, which can also serve as a safeguard uh, from malicious applications of algorithmic decision making and policing and criminal justice. And that central countries should increase their international attitudes in, in order to um, guarantee collaboration and overcome the structural barriers and resource asymmetries that um, are currently existing across countries. So, um, see it basically, and this is a work reference uh, again, a presentation was based on a journal article. And there's a full citation. I'll be happy to answer any question, or if you're interested afterwards, you can drop me an email. Um, this is my email. Thanks for your attention and uh, again, for organizing this.
thank you so much for your um, for your presentation. We've got a couple of questions from um, from the audience. Um, for our first presenter, uh, I apologize if I miss this, but do you have any recommendations on where or how to publish to reach more practitioners, um, avenues other than conferences and journals? Thank you for the question. Um, so um, there is no basic recommendation. There is no silver bullet that would work uh, with uh, every uh, kind of cooperation attempt uh, between practitioners and researchers and by practitioners. Uh, uh, we uh, understand uh, uh, everybody who works in the practice and should apply uh, research uh, outcomes in an ideal world. Uh, for example, the police, uh, for example, first, first responders. Um, and um, so it's, it's very difficult to reach out to stakeholders. Um, according to uh, our participants, uh, this is uh, um, not the researchers uh, who, who should reach out uh, to practitioners. But vice, but but on the other way around. So when practitioners uh, decide that uh, they have the resources and they have um, uh, they, they they have the the manpower and and uh, well any kind of resources uh, to apply scientifically based uh, data and research outcomes, uh, they will reach out to you. Uh, and uh, to address the second question. Uh, which I think it, what was it? It was I used uh, a phrase. Um, yeah, the question is you use the phrase digital society requirements. Could you talk more about what that oh, means? Oh, yeah. For yeah, yeah. Research, research dissemination. Yeah. Research dissemination. Uh, yeah. So um, basically, and it has to do with reaching out to stakeholders. Uh, because in the digital society, we have an uh, extremely uh, shrinked atten uh, attention span. So we cannot concentrate, uh, of course we have to, uh, scholars, but um, anyone outside of the scholarship and academia, uh, they don't have time and they don't have, uh, uh, they are not uh, looking for um, well-written, in-depth uh, uh, articles full of jargons. Uh, so as a, as a dissemination platform, um, I suggest, and not just I, but our uh, respondents and participants uh, suggested uh, to display very br briefly, um, uh, maybe in an infographic, uh, maybe in a, in a, in a brief, uh, um, a Twitter post or any social media post uh, um, our research results. Because uh, if that is catchy enough uh, for, uh, for the stakeholders, uh, they will reach out to you. Um, otherwise, you don't have any chance uh, to work with stakeholders unless uh, you already have a very good working relationship with uh, uh, practitioners. That's certainly something that I found in, in my work, uh, where we, we've created kind of scaffolded uh, products. You've got the more technical academic products and then other, other products that are meant for other audiences. We get a question, uh, looks like it's gonna be our last question. Um, could you speak more to choosing state to state comparisons? Uh, you mentioned covariance, demographics and political views. Yeah. So there are obviously a lot of variables that you could choose to compare states by. So the most important in terms of st statistically speaking, you have to have something that has similar pre-intervention rates to whatever your outcome is. Um, so for myself, I ended up with about a dozen that had similar pre-legalization rates. Only one had similar intercept, which is why I decided to use Utah. Um, but conceptually speaking, again, if I'm looking at all of these reasons that might be related to marijuana arrests for, or any reasons that are related to your outcome, are they similar in those two states? So while statistically speaking, it might be beneficial, but contextually, how can you make that comparison? Um, I, I don't favor the state to state comparison. I don't think that it's the strongest of the options. So, but if that's the only option you have, I think you have to be transparent about that and explain the limitations of comparing state to state. 
thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this, um, for, for uh, their, their work here. This is a very important set uh, of issues, um, some of which we don't talk about nearly enough in the field with communicating um, results and, and communicating challenges. Um, it, it's been a, been a very interesting conversation. This session has been recorded. It'll be put up on our YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube and search for CrimCon to find us there. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll be among the first to know when we've posted everything. We have to do that as soon as we can. You can also subscribe to our mailing list. Go to CrimCon.org and scroll down a bit. We'll find where you can subscribe there. This webinar, just for folks who are uh, hanging out for the next session. We're going to end this, this session that's going to kick everybody out. And if you're looking uh, for the next session, you'll have to rejoin. So thank you again to, to our panelists. We um, really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>